My lords and ladies, what I would like to first do is introduce myself, because you do probably do not know who I am, because I come from the hidden lands. We weren't the outlands of Eitenveld because that was the principality of the outlands. And we weren't the swamplands, which were Trimeris, right? We're the ones in the middle. And that's Texas and Oklahoma. And the first thing I'd like to tell you is how we really came about. Uh, I joined in AS3, and when I joined, uh, uh, we didn't know I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and they didn't know I didn't know I was AS3. Personally, I thought it was just Birmingham, Alabama, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so in AS8, I came to the region that will be known as Unsteora. Right, and when I came there, there were three people in the Dallas area and 20 people in the Stargate area, and they hadn't grown in three years. So we started going out and bringing in people and new people and they came to me and they said, Willow, you've been in the society for a whole five years. <laughs> Tell us what it's like. Mm -hmm. Now, when my uh, mentor, Yorick Wolfhaven, came from California after the Bacon, right, he didn't bother to pick up any information when he was there. He just found the name and what it was and et cetera. So he came back and just made up things. You know, it was the SCA interpreted by Yuriko Wolfhaven. And then I had the great and wonderful experience. And I'll, I'm gonna tell you a story from that visit of meeting Duke Cryadoc when he came on his known world tour. <laughs> because he was meeting every major fighter. And of course, we were all excited. I mean, this was a duke from civilized lands. They actually did things. And he came in and they fought, he fought fight after fight with Yurik. And they started off with broadsword and shield and Yurik beat him. And then Yurik dropped down, he threw away his shield and came at Cryadoc with two swords and he beat him. He then came out and he brought a spear and he beat, I mean, he beat Cryadoc down to the fact that Eric came out with two daggers and he still beat Cryadoc. So we were all politely being nice and going, well, that's what the known world offers. You know, we could do really well. <laughs> Maybe we should move somewhere. <laughs> you know? But I'm sitting there, of course, in those days, my persona was generic lady, right? You know, And so I'm in my dress with my hand out, one foot, right, doing <laughs> generic lady hand movements and all at once we hear this we are on the archery field and all at once we hear this clang and down this hundred yard you know feet or whatever you do to shoot bows in there came an axe Yorick's axe the singing axe and it went boom Boom, boom, right by my nose. Boom, 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 sack, right in the bullseye. And Yurik and Karaidog looked at the target, and Yurik said in a calm voice, I think that's enough for today. <laughs> and that's when I learned the first very important lesson. If you make a bullseye by accident with your singing axe, you quit. <laughs> so I was, I, I'm not the greatest fighter in the world, but I am one of the oldest because back in the days, I don't, I don't know if you knew this, when women could, were not allowed to fight. And I have no earthly idea in other kingdoms, but Aitenfeld seemed to have a lot of funny rules about women. 
Now, either there were really funny rules about women, or there were a bunch of people just, you know, making them up, you know. But I wanted to learn how to fight. I had to learn how to fight. I mean, I was desperate to learn how to fight. And so even though it was illegal for women to fight, I taught Yorick into teaching me. So they put me in all this mismatched armor to the point that you hardly can see me, right? You know. And I went out there and took my stance in front of Yorick. And those were the days you could hit from the top of your head to your ankles. And Yorick took one look at me and started laughing. They yelled, lay on, and he laughed. <laughs> and he laughed. And he laughed. So I hit him in the shins, <laughs> and he stopped laughing. <laughs> but he also stopped teaching me that day. Oh. <laughs> you know, said you said hit you. <laughs> so it was very, very. I mean, I don't know where I would have gone in that area because the Baron of of Sir Sven of. Uh, North, uh, down South Downs, right? Said, heard that there was a woman training under Europe. And he wrote, he sent out on the newsletter that if she came to South Downs and tried to enter a tournament, he'd carry her off the field upside down. <laughs> now, I, I wasn't ever sure about what that meant, right? But I knew for one thing, there's no way that man could pick me up. You know, so I wasn't too worried. So as we left, I finally, I leave the Redier's and I go to the hitherlands of further away than Outlands into the steppes, which is Dallas. And when I'm there, right, we're starting our first event, right? We thought there were several little offshoots you know, things sort of like us. And we thought if we had all three of us who were doing the event, thought if we did a good event, maybe we could lure them in, you know. So I'm the autocrat, but before I get to be the autocrat, where I'm sitting in this meeting with Robert LaHinge and Stephen Shadowkeep, and he, who had been recruited by uh, The first master, what is his name? Anyway, uh, they had been recruited by the man who was the first master. And uh, I'll have to remember that, that's a good story. But anyway, they'd been recruited and they informed me that women couldn't be the chief autocrat in Aitenfeld. Oh, oh, really? Oh yes, and by the way, mm -hmm. later on, this was supported by other people who said women couldn't, you couldn't be the, you could do all the work, you could <laughs> do all the planning, right? But you couldn't be the autocrat. I'm the people. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I guess that's <laughs> where they were trying to do it. <laughs> and looking at these two puppies, right, I said to them, no worky, no credit, -y, no worky. <laughs> and so, I was the supreme autocrat of this event, with minimum help from these two gentlemen, who were, had their nose out of joint. But, uh, so we were doing the event, and I get a call. And the youngest of our members, John Woodsman, called up and said, um, well, he has a wonderful story about him, but John the Woodsman had taken, had offered his freezer to us. Now, he was assuming we'd put chickens and, you know, other such things in the freezer. But another one of our members had killed a boar. <laughs> and he had a haunch of his boar ready to, to be put into freezers. And so I'm going, I don't know what I can do. I'll probably stick it in my refrigerator. And my mother, who was a, and my father, who were members of the SCA at this moment, said, 
my mother said, I don't want a bloody war in my freezer. And I said, it, it's probably not bloody. It's, it's probably perfectly okay. No bloody wars. <laughs> and so I called the next person I knew on the list. And I said, you know, do you have room for a piece of beef? Uh, and, and my family is now chanting, sort of, no bloody boy, no bloody boy, no bloody boy. I'm going, what was that? That's just them saying that they don't want the bloody boar. And the gentleman on the other line, I don't want the bloody <laughs> boar. <laughs> and so this went on and on and on. So I had called everyone else in the group and I finally called John the Woodsman. And I said to him, because he, he's 15, he's living at home, I said, do you have room in your freezer for a piece of hunk of boar? And of course he hears, no bloody boar, no bloody boar, we don't want the bloody boar, you know. And with that, of course, I was expecting him to say no. And so he turned and said to his mother, Mother, may I please put the bloody boar in the freezer? <laughs> and this boy said, certainly, John. <laughs> and so with that, we went off to get the bloody boar. And now I have three car loads of people singing, no bloody boar, no bloody boar. And we get to, <laughs> we get to Robert's house, uh, Robin's house, who had shot the boar. And there on his kitchen table is a piece of frozen meat wrapped in three, four things of cellophane. It's to the point you can't tell what it is. And everybody said, well, that's not very exciting. <laughs> And they left, <laughs> leaving me to take the boar to John. Now, this boar ended up being a slight problem because I was paranoid. I did not know if it really was safe to eat. <laughs> so I cooked it, I baked it, I even microwaved it, <laughs> you know. I did everything in the world to this piece of meat. It was well done. And then when I finished this, I took this piece of bloody pour and we put it on our beautiful table, right? And um, it looked like a piece of charred meat. And Chorus of Natterhelm, who became Duke Chorus of Natterhelm, went crazy over the boar. And as people ate it, until it was left to one big bone, right? bone, you know, and he ran around going, I'm the bloody boar, I'm the bloody <laughs> boar, I'm the bloody boar. <laughs> but that event, we captured all these people, including 60 gypsies. <laughs> and uh, so we went from three people to 64 people, right? <laughs> and uh, which was great, which of course uh, uh, made the beginning of our my clan could all because as we were sitting at another event the gypsies were on one side of the fire and they were singing and they were dancing and they were drinking and they were having fun and on the other side of the fire was all the non-gypsies right <laughs> <coughs> and red dog mackenzie my father said let's have a clan a drinking clan and we'll toast to the clan every time we're together and confuse the gypsies. So we all got up and said, to the clan. And a week later, we had come up with the name Kadal. And I also had ran a bid to be the chief, but of course nobody really cared, so I ended up being the chief of the clan Kadal, which meant that at every event we went to, we raised our cups. Now, we, this was all done with smoke and mirrors. My father uh, helped recruit people. In fact is, he recruited a lady who was walking her dog to our 12th night. 
And she happened to have a costume and she showed up at Twelfth Night and she sat with the Clan Cadol. And 20 something years later, I said, well, how did you come into the, this SEA? And she says, well, your father recruited me off the street. <laughs> 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 and uh, so you, we never knew who we would get. We just packed the area. You know, it, it was an illusion. And then we'd all say, two Clan Cadal. <laughs> Clan Cadal. <laughs> yes. And, you know. and by doing this, you can claim yourself a member of Clan Cadal. <laughs> <laughs> But Clan Cadal doesn't do anything. It just is, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, we had one rule. We said we we actually encouraged everybody to be as politically active as they wanted to be. The clan wasn't politically active. It just drank, you know. But uh, it was as, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> but if you were going to get into a political conflict and you were going to, you know, uh, uh, stab your clan brother or sister in the back, you're supposed to call or bring a note saying, I'm planning on staggering you in the back. <laughs> now, you would think this rule would never be obeyed, but actually it was very often, you know, uh, but like all good, as, good as, uh, Scottish clans, we decided that we needed somebody in the family on every side. This gave you the advantage to having someone to talk to you know, when you're working out the compromise. And also that meant if you lost, your brother or cousin on the other side could arrange, you know, more uh, favorable conditions of surrender. 